All right, so we have the first question, true or false? A regenerated heart means we will no longer have the desire to sin. Okay, all right, Brother Jordan, um, the uh, protocol that we've been doing is it, whoever submits the question answers last. Uh, so you just hold on and then you can correct us all and tell us you know, how we went wrong in our answers because you, you, you gave the question, so you must have the right answer. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Sister Heather, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I, I, as, uh, um, if you have a regenerated heart, once you're saved, you no longer have the desire to sin. Um, we still do sin sometimes. Um, it's not anything that we plan to do. It's not anything that we want to do, but we're human and we make mistakes. And because of that, we do sometimes sin. Um, when I say sometimes, I mean, what I mean to say is pretty much every day in one way or another, I fall short of perfection. And that's what sin is. It's it's just simply falling short. Um, it's, it's missing the mark of perfection. So um, yeah. We we don't mean to. We don't want to. That's not what we plan to do, but it happens. So that's my answer. All right, thank you. All right, Sister Renee. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm gonna say false because we still have flesh. It doesn't say that when you're saved, all of a sudden your flesh is changed. Uh, it does say that now we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We should walk in newness of life because we should hear that spirit, not quench or grieve that spirit. And that's how we get victory. Not focusing on things of the flesh, not focusing on law, but focusing on the resurrection power of Jesus and our identity in Christ. And that's when Romans 8 talks about there is there now no more condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now, I believe that this is actually talking about temporally. A lot of people use this, you know, salvation wise. And I would agree there is no condemnation. And we are the only ones that have the spirit because it says you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But this whole chapter is about how to walk out our identity in Christ. So when it says who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, true, we're not walking after circumcision and things of the flesh like the law, uh, because that does give you condemnation. Uh, this is uh, about the feelings of condemnation, the actual presence of feeling condemned by the law. There is no more of that condemnation to those that are in Christ when you walk after the spirit, because you're not law focused. That's why you have. The, you know, condemnation because the law has already made you guilty and you know you need a savior. So, so it says for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. We still have a carnal mind. We still have flesh for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. And that is why the condemnation is still in us because we're law focused. And I, I see this chapter so much differently now than I used to, um, because this is clearly telling us who we are in Christ and how we do get victory in our walk. Um, and so it, it clearly tells that we are, we still have flesh. And it says in Galatians 5, 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, capital S. And the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So you desire to do what's right, but you can't always achieve it. Now, there are some that claim they 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 haven't sinned in years. They're deceived. They they really think they're righteous now. They, don't, they forget the, the sin uh, of little things, being apathetic to others' feelings or, uh, you know, when, you, when somebody does you wrong, you're supposed to just take the hit and love your enemies. We don't do that. There, there's a lot of things that we fail in. And Jesus really, uh, like Luke says, ratchet it down. 
the standards of the law. If you look at a woman to lust after her, you, you've committed it. So uh, I agree that we, I, I will agree with Heather. Yes, the spirit is in us. He helps us uh, desire things. W what changed for me? The best way I can explain what happened for me is that all of a sudden, things that I thought were okay just were not okay. I mean, it was it was almost immediate. It was uh, things that I thought were no big deal, all of a sudden I was aware of. And I realized that is not pleasing to God. That is not, that doesn't look good as a Christian to do these things. And I got grieved when I thought about doing it. And so that's what changed for me is I had this inner conviction that I knew it was wrong. I knew it wouldn't please God. I'm not talking about just standard 10 commandments here. I'm talking about higher standards than the law. Yea, we establish the law higher than that. So uh, that was the inner voice that I heard. But my flesh didn't go anywhere. My flesh wasn't perfected. And so I still could have desires in the flesh, but I don't follow through with them because I am a Christian. That doesn't mean I'm perfect or I think I'm sinless now. Uh, I am in my position in Christ. I am not uh, judged as a sinner. I, I'm a saint. Because of the righteousness of God in Christ. But uh, some people preach this, and I think it's wrong because they're telling people they have to fight a fight that doesn't exist. And if you can't admit that there is a struggle, you can never overcome it. So when you go out there and say, Here, uh, if you have the Holy Spirit and you get saved, you will never desire sin again. Okay, th and then there's a babe in Christ and he starts wanting to watch porn again. Does it mean that Christ didn't save him? No, but they're going to think it does. And what happens here? They get introspective and they start saying, well, maybe I, me, didn't do something right. And they start looking at what they did and questioning the promises of God by faith in Christ. And so this is very dangerous doctrine, I believe, to say that there is no more struggle because you're automatically saved, then you will just, you know, you won't even desire to do it. And if that's the case, there wouldn't be a plethora of verses uh, like in Corinthians that says, oh, uh, I hear that there's commonly reported fornication among you. And, and this goes on and on about the strife and all the suing each other and everything else going on in that church. And if that's the case, were those people never saved? They weren't really saved to begin with? So I think we have to admit that there is a struggle between the spirit, capital S spirit, and our flesh. God will and does help us live a good Christian life. And that will come with maturity and spending time in God's word and walking in the resurrection power of Christ and getting the mind of Christ. But that is a process that occurs with maturity, not a, a, a force of a mystical force that just automatically makes us that way. Okay. Amen. i give you two amens. That was wonderful. I uh, Jordan, that was an excellent question, uh, and I, I would say it's a very important question. That everybody needs to get this, this right. And fortunately, we have the Apostle Paul who actually answers your exact question. Uh, it, it, let's go to Romans chapter 7. I'm going to just read 14 through 24, and then we can discuss this. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal sold under sin for that which i do i allow not for what i would that do i not but what i hate that i do if then i do that which is i would not i consent unto the law that it is good now then it is no more i that do it but sin that dwelleth in me for i know that in me that is in my flesh 
dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but to perform that which is good I find not. For the good I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body or from this death? Um, well, I'll read the last final verse of the chapter. It says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Uh, now, a couple of things we should uh, ask ourselves as we think about those verses. Who's saying that? The Apostle Paul. And uh, when you study the, the, the New Testament, uh, apart from Jesus, and let's say maybe John and Peter, there is nobody more prominent than Paul. In fact, Paul wrote more than half of the New Testament, 13 epistles, maybe 14 if he wrote Hebrews. Um, Paul is um, uh, admired and loved and respected as much as any Christian I think that's ever lived. And many of us here would say, who's your favorite apostle? It's Paul. Uh, but here we have this great Christian, truly great Christian. He endured so much. He was uh, beaten over and over again. He was whipped over and over again. Uh, he, he was uh, shipwrecked, snake bitten, stoned and left for dead. And finally, imprisoned and then beheaded. So this is what he endured for the cause of Christ. Uh, and, and yet he's saying as much as he loved the Lord and wanted to serve him, he could not master sin. He's saying, I personally struggle with this. I want to do the right thing that I know what's right and wrong, but instead I do the wrong thing. And I, I don't want to do the wrong thing, and, and yet I do it. But it's not me. It's sin that dwells in me. Where does it dwell? It dwells in your members, in your flesh, your body. There's only one uh, solution to this that's perfect, and that is uh, a glorified body. So there will be a rapture slash resurrection where we get these bodies that don't have the flesh sin nature anymore. And then we will not have this conflict. If you go to my YouTube channel, Brother Luke, and you go to the very top playlist on the homepage, uh, it says the Bible says, and I think about the fourth or fifth video in there on that playlist, it says it's titled The Christian's Struggle. This is a struggle not unique to Paul. This is a struggle we will all have. Now, we can't get the full victory of it until the resurrection, but we can uh, get victories in, here and there and grow and mature and, and becomes less of a problem. Uh, that What happens is when we're born again, the Holy Spirit of God uh, regenerates us, connect the spirit of God and our spirit brings our spirit alive. And now the Holy Spirit is there forever. And the spirit of God wants to transform us so that uh, we have a saying on, on the channel, uh, all these things that we post in the, the truisms. And one of them I got from Malcolm Smith, it says repentance equals exchange of mind. Now we always say it's change of mind. But Malcolm Smith said, think about it, it's exchange of mind. What we want to do is get rid of our mind and instead have the mind of Christ. And now you don't have to surrender your will over to God in order to get saved. That's a blasphemy, a false gospel. But once we are saved, the more that we're able to surrender our will over to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, the more this problem will be resolved. Uh, but I don't think any of us should expect that we can perfect it. If the Apostle Paul couldn't, I hate to say that I'm a better Christian than, than, than Paul. There's more I could say, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So, uh, okay, Brother Jordan, uh, tell us what you say. Yeah, well, I think this is probably one of the biggest 
questions to wrestle with when you are a babe in Christ and even your experienced Christians because so many people try to defeat their sin in their flesh. And the thing is, you cannot fight flesh with flesh. That is what happens in the born again, um, regenerate, sorry, regeneration of your heart that the spirit comes and dwells within you because it's only walking with the spirit that you are able to overcome any of these sinful desires. And the Lord can deliver you from these things, of course. But what we need to understand, understand is our flesh will always desire to sin. It will always desire wicked. The spirit will never desire to sin. Our soul is in the middle of those two fighting back and forth. And it's all about what you choose to walk after, what you choose to feed every day. If you choose to feed the flesh, you're going to fall into sin. And I think we can all agree that sin is a very slippery slope. And the more it starts off small, it gets bigger, and then it gets out of control. And as a result, you start to distance yourself from God. The thing that we need to remember in these moments, um, conviction is actually a blessing from God to draw us near to him. But the enemy will twist that and create shame, which will distance us from God. And as a result of that shame, we start to lose our fellowship with God. And as a result, more sin creeps in. It's a never-ending cycle. So under Christ, there are no transgressions written to our account. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That is the assurance of our salvation. That is the liberty that we have through the gospel. What we are judged upon is how we use that liberty. And you have two options. When we get to that judgment seat and he throws your works into the fire, you're either going to create a lot of smoke in heaven that day, or you're going to have refined jewels for your crown. But the important thing to remember from that verse, and this is what a lot of your lordship salvation work-based gospels will say, is the man will be saved. Now, when I say something like this, those people will come out of the woodworks and say, well, you're just preaching a license to sin. No, what we're actually doing is we have full awareness of just how severe sin is. First John tells us, if you say you have no sin, you're deceived. And when you go after deception, all that's doing is putting spiritual blinders on you. So I think it's very important to remember that to feed the spirit is to go into the word daily, pray, go uh, fellowship. And those things in our very busy world um, can often get overlooked. So understand where your um, fault, where your shortcomings can exist because you can't, you can't do anything in, re in regards to your temptation. You can't control what you're tempted by but you can control what you expose yourself to. And as Christians, we should be exposing ourselves to those things that are wholly good. So understand the distinction between the two, the spirit and the flesh, and then you make the active decision every day to walk after the spirit because we know that if we walk after the flesh, it's going to be detrimental. Well, that was a wonderful answer. Uh, the last point was especially... Uh poignant and you know that um, what we expose ourselves to that's up to us uh, so if someone is uh, struggling with alcoholism the last thing they want to do is go to a bar or bring alcohol into their home uh, all right great answers uh, we have a, a follow-up time now uh, who would like to give a follow-up answer I, I wanted to respond um, yeah like you say you know they always say hey hang around a barber shop long enough you'll get a haircut so yeah, you don't want to expose yourself to it. I agree with that. And I also agree with Heather that there are changes of desires. And I, I tried to explain that personally, but I believe the quote that you gave, Brother Luke, some people say that was Paul talking prior to his conversion. That's what the sinless perfectionists say. They say, no, no, that was Paul before. He didn't have that struggle anymore. Then why did Paul say, I die daily? I die daily daily because he's telling the church this is how you get victory you focus on jesus and the quotations that you gave well the wretched man that i am that is going to be your position if you are law focused the good that i would that i can't and jordan 
just said, if you're law focused and flesh focused, you cannot you cannot get rid of sin through flesh. And this is the most ridiculous argument, the license to sin argument, because the strength of sin is the law, not grace. And so it's just ridiculous because grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. So when people say that, I'm like, do they not have grace? I mean, don't they get that? So, uh, you know, like I was saying immediately, it was not okay for me. I was not comfortable in it. I was grieved by it. I did not want to have that feeling anymore. But the wrong path would be to go back to self focus and law going, oh, I failed there. I failed here. I got to wrench it down and start really getting my willpower. And what did, the, what did Ray Cover say? Uh, do it again and mean it this time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That is not how you're saved by doing it again and meaning it this time. Jesus meant it when he carried that cross and died on it. That's what saved us. And that's the focus. So the whole point Paul's making is that he walks in the resurrection power because he dies daily and he reckons himself dead indeed unto sin. And if his, he died already, then he can't serve sin because dead guys don't sin. So he's saying, I'm alive in Christ. So I'm only going to live by the prompting of the spirit and not listen to the dead guy. And, and if you go over, I like uh, Kevin in the chat mentioned Ephesians, because there's no reason to have warfare if the battle is over. Now, the battle was over when Christ gave us victory. He has everything under his feet. But as long as we are in the flesh, it's an ongoing battle for Christians to not be led astray or allow sin to devour them. And, and that's what I try to get people to see. Sin is a trap. It is a trap to destroy you. It is not something, yay, we can do it and still get away with it. It is, it's like saying, yay, I get to go to prison. It doesn't even make sense. So what it says here, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the wiles of the devil. And I think Jordan was uh, pointing out that Satan will use it. He'll use that healthy, the healthy conviction, the healthy, little bit of healthy shame there and turn it into condemnation, which paralyzes you and gets you introspective. And Victoria was talking about her victory in Christ. But the reason she has victory is that she knows who she is in Christ. And she's constantly walking in the truth of that, that she's the righteousness of God in Christ. And she's a, a child of the king. And that's what uh, helps her get victory. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness. All this is from the Old Testament. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, this one's my favorite. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Helmet of salvation is nothing is going to penetrate this thing on my head to get into my mind to tell me that my Lord didn't rescue me. I died with Christ. That person is dead and gone. And I am not going to go back to being dead in my sin. You know, uh, I want to walk ahead in newness of life. But the key is, is understanding there is a battle. So if we say you automatically uh, just do what's right now, because I can't believe you did that. And he's a Christian. I can. Because he still got flesh and I could see it coming a mile away. He stopped reading his Bible. He stopped hanging out with Christians. He started exposing himself to things he shouldn't have done. He was left in his, you know, like a, our brains are like a bad neighborhood. Don't go in it alone. When you get these thoughts, you need to go and share them with another Christian. So uh, I think the battle is on and we need to know there's a battle in order to fight it. It's not that we cannot come out victorious because we can. We can. And I think we can even uh, live greater than the dead letter of the law in that we love our enemies like Christ loved us.
Amen. Preach it. Preach it, sister. <laughs> and uh, the one thing I would like to add to that is, you know, when it comes to, because this is the question that they'll come to you if you're a free grace believer or you have adhere to any sort of eternal security doctrine is, well, why does Satan tempt you? Satan wants you to sin because he doesn't, he knows he can't have your salvation. He wants your testimony. Look at what just happened with Ravi Zacharias. That man was brilliant. He paved the way for so many Christians. And now it's destroyed in a matter of months because of a lifestyle of sin. That's why the devil wants sin in your life, because he wants your whole testimony to be absolutely destroyed. So definitely listen to that conviction when it comes, because the more you engage in sin, the quieter that conviction is going to become. And the stronger the chances are that your entire ministry calling or anything can go right down the chute, just like it did with Robbie Zacharias. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Right. Absolutely. Amen. 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 Do you want to know why? Because if I'm not effective in my Bible study time, if I'm not spending time reading the word, if I am not um, in prayer every day, then I'm open to the temptations that are coming against me. And if I'm open to the temptations that are coming against me, how in the world am I going to be a witness to anyone else? Because I'm so caught up in this flesh and everything that this flesh desires. That's exactly why the devil wants to make us stumble. It's not for our salvation's sake because we were saved and sealed from the moment of salvation. That was a moment. That was not a process that we have to go through. And as far as remaining sinless, we're never going to be sinless. We always are going to sin because we're humans. And because of that, we have desires in our hearts. And whenever we go to make a choice, we have to choose between going left or going right, going, um, going forward, going backwards. And every single time, every decision that we ever make, do I make rice for dinner? Do I make pasta for dinner? That affects the rest of my day. It also affects the rest of my children's day, which affects my ministry because Let's say I chose to have carbs. I'm diabetic. I don't need to be eating carbs. I should be eating some protein, have, have a steak or something like that, which probably would taste better. But anyway, that's beside the point. The point is, if I chose to eat those carbs because I wanted them, if I'm just in my flesh and desperately want to eat a whole entire bag of potato chips, I'm not doing any good for my, my own body. And because of that, I'm not doing any good for anyone who I was called to minister to because I'm sitting there in my flesh, gorging myself on potato chips. It's silly little things like this. The, the, the Jesus upped the ante a hundred percent when he, when he said, if you have even the thought of, of um, lust for a woman, you don't even have to do it. All you have to do is think about it. If you can control your thoughts, then you can control whether or not you sin, but it's not possible. And that is the point. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. And um, there's actually a song. Uh, I don't remember all of the words for it, from it, but um, there's people, uh, it says something about there's people who believe they need to try hard and then try a little more. But if that's the way it's supposed to be, then tell me what the cross is for, because that's where all of that sin went. It didn't come to my account. It was removed from my account. And I was called righteous in spite of it. You're hey, muted, Brother Luke. I can't hear you, Luke. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh... That was, uh, um, did, would you believe me if I said I did that on purpose for humor's sake? No, I didn't. No, no, no. Could you have that silly smirky grin when you tell a fib? <laughs> wow, you got me. Uh, well, uh, we could continue with this question, the entire program, and then some easily. Uh, 
but we have other questions. Uh, I, the last thing I think I would say is that there are people that uh, teach what they call the sinless perfection uh, gospel, uh, and they, they believe that we can, should, and must stop sinning completely. And some of them claim that they've done it. Uh, Jesse Morrell, Jed Smock, others like that, they, they claim they haven't sinned. Uh, Jed Smock, uh, his wife said, he, Jed hasn't sinned for 40 years one time. Uh, but what they're doing is what we should call easy legalism. In other words, I could say that I, uh, I have a sin for, all, for the last 35 years if I water down the law so that uh, so that uh, you know it's easy to pass the test. Like, well, first of all, it's only the Ten Commandments, and I know and I, I know I quit lying, and I haven't murdered anybody. So now, see, that's easy legalism. But Jesus, who will permit that? He ratchets it, he tightens it, he he makes the law so strict it's impossible. That's why his apostles asked him after the rich young ruler, "How is it possible for anyone to be saved?" And he said, "With well, man, it is impossible, but with God, it's possible." So uh, we need to be Christ conscious, not sin conscious. When we're focused on Jesus, we will uh, uh, not be thinking about sin. Uh, everybody said so many good things. So uh, anybody want to say one one more comment before we? Um... Ray Comfort claims sinless perfection. He says uh, he doesn't even look at a woman with lust anymore. So he 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 reaches the standards. But I want to say every time they claim they don't sin anymore, they sin. That, that's a sin in itself. That's spiritual pride, self-righteousness. Hey, I've made my heart clean. I am free from sin. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. many people. Yeah. <laughs> many people can say that. Yeah. 